Well, I thought I would make this quick tutorial uh, looking at how to convert the glass ice scene uh, that we built in the earlier series of videos into a dynamic simulation. And this is a bit of a quick and dirty tutorial because the outcome is not perfect and there's one major thing that is wrong with it. Um, I'll mention that later on. So I'm just going to talk through the file here. So you'll be familiar with the objects in our scene from the earlier tutorial. Uh, and the first thing I've done is create a slightly different variant of the glass. Let me show that. So what I've done is merged in our original glass, and then I've just used an edit sop to pull out the sides of the glass like so. And the reason I've done that is because that will simplify the calculations Houdini needs to do to keep the liquid inside the glass. You'd need a very great number of substeps to make sure that the particles inside the glass didn't pass through it because the glass is very thin, the original glass. Uh, this new glass, which is much wider, will make that calculation easier and it won't affect the simulation at all because the liquid is entirely inside the glass. So I then have used the rigid body tool to import that into a dot network. So let's just have a look here at the dot network and we can see that we've got the glass bought in and it's just uh, using a static solver. Uh, the other thing I've done is bought in the ice cubes. Uh, each of the ice cubes is being bought in as a rigid body object. So if we have a look in wireframe here uh, we can see we have those ice cubes. Let me just turn off the display of the other glass. And what happens is as we play the simulation, those crash down into the bottom of the glass like so. So far so simple. Uh, we then want to add some liquid. So we need an emitter. And I'm using for the emitter here this source, let me display that, just a little cube here. Uh, now it's important to note that the cube is inside uh, the container, which is the fluid container. Uh, and by the way, I'm using um, volume-based fluids here, not particle-based fluids. I apologize for earlier referring to particle-based fluids. Uh, so that's my volume fluid source. So I've just set up this container and used source from object. And if we have a look at our auto.network we can see that. Uh, somewhere down here we will have our fluid, which is our fluid box, our fluid solver, and these by the way more or less have the standard parameters. And then the apply source is referring to that source box and I've added a little bit of variation here. I've given it a velocity of minus one, so this is shooting this liquid down here. And the other thing you'll notice is that we've enabled use deforming geometry here. And that means that this is going to recreate this source every frame. And the reason that I'm doing that is because, let me go up to my scene view, I've in fact got some animation on this source and what I've done is put in some random rotations using a motion FX chop. So if we have a look at this, just disable simulation for the moment so that we can see this more. We can see this rotates round like this randomly as we go along the slider. And that's going to create a nice interesting bit of motion as the liquid flows into the glass. The other thing to note is that my source does not start emitting immediately. If we have a look here in the emission amount, I've put an expression in here so that uh, $SF, which is the simulation frame, greater than 20. Now, uh, an expression in Houdini evaluates, as you know, to either 0 or 1. It's 0 if it's false, 1 if it's true. So this is going to have the value of 0 until we get to frame above frame 20, in which case it's going to have a value I've got, uh, in fact, got uh, simulation disabled there, but let's just enable it. And as we play this through, what we should see 
is that when this gets to frame 20 this will change to 1 and we'll start getting fluid emitted from this source and there we are uh, we need to stop it to be able to see that the value has changed but we can see that the liquid is being emitted and this has changed to 1 so that's our, our liquid being emitted and the reason I've done that is to uh, allow time for these blocks of ice to fall uh, to the bottom of the glass there's also a change I've made to these ice blocks which is that I've turned off the compute mass uh, control here and given them a mass of 100 and the reason I've done that is in fact uh, to do with the most complicated part of this simulation which is the buoyancy now we need the liquid to lift up uh, these blocks of ice and in order for that to look natural uh, we would need the mass to be equal for each block of ice uh, so that the mass doesn't depend on the size of the block of ice so that they are each pushed up uh, more or less equally because they have equal density so let's uh, start seeing that happen and then I'll explain how it's done so I'm going to play this through and I'm going to pause the video because this is going to take a while to simulate until our simulation is cached out so I've uh, simulated the first 160 or so frames of this, which allows us to see what happens. So our liquid, the, the ice falls to the bottom, the liquid starts filling up the glass. And as it fills up the glass, the ice floats to the top. And that, of course, is what would happen in real life. So how do we get the ice to float to the top? Well, the answer is that uh, there's a force in Houdini uh, which allows us to achieve this, and it's called the buoyancy force. And let's wait for this just to... Let me go back uh, a few frames here so that we're in the area that I simulated earlier. There we go. So I need to... Um, locate the node here, buoyancy force. So the buoyancy force acts on uh, geometry, on rigid body objects, and it produces a force, in this case I've got an upward force with a value of 25,000 uh, in the y direction, on, and it produces that force on objects according to some data which is attached. And we need to attach the data here so first of all, uh, let me say that the buoyancy force needs to come towards the bottom of your network after the merge node because it will need to reference both uh, the fluid information here but also obviously the rigid bodies which are the things that it's going to affect. Uh, but we don't want it to affect everything in the scene, we just want it to affect those rigid bodies. So you can see here that I've set it to affect a group of object called ice cubes and what I've done is before uh, the merge node so when the only objects in our data stream are the three rigid bodies, the ice cubes I've used a group node just to make those into a group called ice cubes so when we use that here in the buoyancy force that ensures that our force is only going to apply to those rigid body objects. Now what uh, it expects to find attached is a surface fluid surface so that's the data from our fluid uh, which contains the surface information for the fluid so let's have a look back at our fluid and I'm going to have a look at a details view and if we look here at our fluid we can see there's a field here called surface and it's a scalar field uh, in fact it's it's a sine distance field but we don't need to worry about that so we need to get this field and apply it as sub data to our buoyancy force and we do that using a fetch data node and we're fetching from the fluid object uh, we're fetching the field called 
surface and you can give it any arbitrary name here you like. I, I've called it B-surf. So the tricky thing about the buoyancy node is getting this force level right. Because if you have the force too strong, uh, what it will do is just shoot the ice out of the glass because it will be such a strong impulse that it will it'll throw the ice up unrealistically above the surface of the water. Alternatively, of course, if this is too small, then it won't lift the ice up and the ice will just stay at the bottom of the glass. Uh, and you need really to test various values for the mass of the ice, which impacts on this, and for the size of the force. And you need by trial and error just to find what works. But it can help uh, to reduce the number of divisions in your fluid here. At the moment, my fluid is simulating quite slowly, and the reason for that is because the uh, fluid has got a high number of divisions, 100 divisions. So it's it's simulating very slowly. You could change this down to something like 20. That will change uh, the accuracy of your simulation. It'll change the properties of your simulation quite considerably. Uh, you can't use it to, to really sculpt or, or decide how your simulation is going to work, but it will work. You will be able to balance off that force and the mass uh, using a smaller simulation. And I promised to say a little bit about what goes wrong with this, why this simulation isn't perfect. And it's not really uh, that the simulation isn't perfect. It's to do with the surfacing of this liquid. So let me just have a look at that. I can't now find, there we are, there's the fluid surface. So let's uh, turn off the glass and let's have a look. Let's turn off the ice cubes as well. Just have a look at this fluid surface. Now the problem with this fluid surface, you, if you can see, it's it's not perfectly uh, straight on the outsides. Uh, and so it actually overlaps a little bit occasionally with this glass that it's meant to be colliding with. There are gaps. You can see, in fact, there's a, a gap here. Uh, but there are also areas where it, it stretches out beyond the glass. And that's more or less unavoidable uh, in this kind of uh, simulation. The other thing uh, that you can't do in this situation is what we did with the earlier modeling, which was to distinguish between the surfaces where the glass touches the liquid directly, uh, where you have a different transition from different uh, indices of refraction, to one where the liquid is facing the air, for example. And in this case, we just have to render the uh, liquid object and the glass object separately and try to make sure that the indices of refraction match up enough for it to look okay. But if you have a look at the final video, what you will see it th is that there's a bit of uh, artifacts here, f a bit of popping in our liquid as it goes through, partly because it, it breaks away from the side of the glass and you get uh, what the renderer will think is an air bubble, uh, or it pops the other side and, and overlaps, uh, penetrates the glass, uh, which also creates artifacts. So you can uh, see in the video, it's not too clear because, of course, there's a lot of action here with the water uh, flowing into the glass. Uh, but you can see a bit of that happening, and uh, that makes it uh, a slightly less than perfect uh, render. Well, I hope that's been useful. Thank you very much.